So, hi everyone. Uh, thanks for coming to this talk. Um, this is David Lawrence. I'm Ying Li. Uh, we're both security engineers at Docker, as Katie mentioned. Um, this talk was supposed to have been given by Nathan McCauley, who couldn't make it this time. Uh, I know he was on the, um, the uh, agenda. agenda, yes. Um, so hopefully we can fill uh, his and Diego's uh, big security issues for this DockerCon. Um, I know that the title of the session is called uh, The Security Deep Dive, and we've done a lot of deep dives previously about application runtime security and container isolation, which are really important topics. But runtime security is just one aspect of um, developing and distributing <coughs> software. And what also needs to be considered to make your application secure is this whole process, which isn't actually discussed very often. So we'd instead like to do a deep dive into securing uh, what securing this pipeline entails and how Docker products can help you do so. So think of a physical product like a car or a toy or an iPhone. It's not enough to just to think about the security of your end product, what kind of clamshell packaging you're going to attach to it on a store, or what kind of car alarms you put on your car. Um, you have to think of your entire supply chain pipeline. Um, when you build one of these uh, toys or cars, you have to source physical components, assemble them into your product, ship them to your stores or warehouses, from which they'll be distributed to your end customers or users. At every stage in this process, and at every transition between stages, not just at the end stage, there's a possibility that your product could be tampered with or stolen. And this maps mostly one-to-one, -one, uh, this product lifecycle maps one-to-one -to, -one to a software development lifecycle. You have to take your source code and dependencies, build and package your application, ship them to some kind of application storage, maybe over an insecure network, maybe your storage is insecure, like if it's SourceForge, um, maybe and where they can be deployed by either you or your end users. And securing your software supply chain is a lot like securing a physical supply chain. You have to be able to identify all the parts of your pipeline, both physical assets like uh, physical components or your code, as well as any human participants. You need to ensure that your build process and build quality are consistent. Uh, when shipping your product from its build location, you also need to protect it in transit, especially if there are any untrusted intermediary destinations, like if you have some kind of caching layer. Um, before your shipment reaches your final destination, you need to validate its contents against a declared bill of materials, and you need some way to make sure that you actually ship it to the right destination instead of uh, some destination that is faked. So the first component in that pipeline, identity, uh, sort of builds an underlying uh, component to everything else that we need to do. If you can't identify the actors and the entities within your system, you might as well not bother. Uh, so how does Docker help us with identifying pieces of our system? Well, images are given, image IDs. Uh, users have both accounts on Hub or uh, DTR or UCP, um, and they actually have cryptographic keys as well. Uh, Docker hosts within a swarm cluster have unique identifiers that they hold for the lifetime of that node, and an entire swarm itself is identified so that you know which nodes are part of which swarm and you can't accidentally have a node act within the wrong cluster. So users primarily identified with a password. A uh, big improvement that Docker's made in the last year is passwords used to be stored base64 encoded in uh, just your file system. Uh, it now uses your keychain. Huge improvement over how we used to do it. Uh, and additionally, if you're familiar with Notary, which is integrated into Docker as Docker Content Trust, you will have uh, encryption keys, or I should say signing keys, um, that you as a user can then take and sign any content that you publish to ensure that nobody can tamper with it, and anybody that needs to consume that content can use those signatures to determine that it legitimately came from you and hasn't been tampered with. Within Swarm, when a node comes up, it is given a unique ID. The cluster as a whole has an ID. Uh, that ID lives with the node for its lifetime, and we don't want to use things like IP addresses to identify these nodes, because in public clouds, IP addresses can be volatile, uh, whereas the node itself hasn't changed because it has a new IP address. How do we enforce this? Because ideally, we want cryptographic security over these kinds of identities. Well, within our Swarm, we have a leader who also acts as a CA and the leader will issue certificates to every single node that joins the cluster. The certificate contains the cluster ID as the organization. It contains the role of the node as the organizational unit, preventing a worker from pretending to be a manager. Uh, and it also contains the ID of that node as the common name. 
And this gives us cryptographic guarantees whenever any two nodes need to interact, that they can identify each other, they can identify the roles that each of them hold, and they can identify that they're actually in the same cluster and they should be talking to each other. And finally, for images, all images can be identified by a SHA-256 checksum. Of course, it's not particularly useful to humans. Like, we're not good at remembering 64-character hex strings. So we also have labels in Docker. And traditionally, one of the problems has been that the registry is responsible for name resolution. So you just go to the registry and say, give me latest, and it decides what latest is, and you don't have a way to verify that. With Docker Content Trust, you as the publisher of an image will sign the relationship using the keys that you generated earlier to say that this particular label has this particular checksum. And now anybody that wants to download your image can use that signature to determine not only that the image came from you, but also they now have a checksum they can use so that when they go and download the image, they know they got the correct content. So if you want a build process that is consistent, you need to control your dependencies. And you probably have dependencies outside just a doc base Docker image. Um, you, by knowing what your components are and putting in only known good, known good components, you're more likely to have a stable, a predictable build, which will be much easier to test for defects or vulnerabilities. So how do we know what a good component is? Well, hopefully, you've tested it with your software and made sure it works. But more than that, um, you want to authenticate that it comes from a source that you expect, that it was not corrupted or altered in transit from that source, and that it is the most recent patched version of that source um, that is compatible with your software. Uh, you also want to pin your dependencies so that on every subsequent build, uh, your build is actually consistent, so that if a vulnerability is discovered, you can tell if it was your code or a dependency bump. And the way we recommend you get consistent builds is to use a Docker file to build an image. This way, the dependencies are uh, obtained in the exact same manner, and the builds are done the same across multiple different hosts. And the first element of a Docker file is the from line. Um, and you can start off your uh, known good components with an official base image. These are commonly used combinations of components. Um, they're curated and patched regularly for vulnerabilities. Uh, they're well documented, and they try to promote best practices for the software that they encapsulate. Um, they're also provided over HTTPS from Docker Hub, so you get good authenticity and integrity guarantees when you pull them. They're also signed with Docker Content Trust, so that even if you're installing from an untrusted registry or just installing from a cache on disk, you can still validate that authenticity and integrity. Um, as David mentioned, Docker Content Trust also provides a freshness guarantee, so you know that you're installing a recent version of uh, an official image, or at least a recently recertified version of an official image. Um, note that we are pinning the version. You could also pin by SHA, which would mean that you always install the exact same image. But when official images are patched and remediated, you, when you rebuild, you wouldn't necessarily pull down like the patched version. You would be pinned to the vulnerable version. But you, again, you probably need to download more dependencies than just a Docker image. Um, and if you need to do so, it would be best if you downloaded it over TLS so you can get those same authenticity and integrity guarantees. Um, if you can't pin to a version, you can pin to a checksum. You can validate the checksum after you've downloaded it if you can't actually download it from a content addressable store. If your dependencies provide signatures and a way to validate those signatures, you should definitely do so. Again, this protects you from an unsafe network or an untrusted repository. For instance, uh, apt repositories require that all their packages be signed via GPG keys, so you should definitely try to validate the signature of all of the apt packages that you install. And obviously, while it's important for you to validate the signatures of all of your incoming data, we talked about signing your own images. It's also important for you to sign all of the content that you actually produce, because when you transport it across a network, you don't necessarily know if you can trust that network or potentially intermediate locations where the content might get stored or cached. So Docker Content Trust provides you with uh, three primary uh, components. You have cryptographic signatures, which identify the user that actually published the piece of content. Uh, and then importantly, that content is signed into a collection. A lot of people sort of ask us about Docker Content Trust, you know, why didn't you just use GPG? Uh, one of the things that GPG doesn't give you is context. When you get a signed piece of content that has a GPG signature, 
You don't actually know if the person who signed it meant for it to be published as a production component. It could be that they signed it as a test build and sent it to somebody they work with, but somebody has intercepted that or otherwise gotten hold of the test build and the signature and published it, and you're now installing something with a known vulnerability. So signing your content into this collection is an explicit action that says, this collection represents everything I want people to trust in production. Uh, and by adding a new tag to that, you're saying, I want to trust this particular tag, which maps via the cryptographic signature that guarantees it to a particular checksum. Uh, and now users know that like, when I install Alpine Latest, I actually got the Alpine Latest that was legitimately meant to be published to production. And this is the checksum, so I can verify it when I download it. And finally, Content Trust provides you with expiry. So another thing the GPG doesn't provide is once a piece of content is signed, it's signed forever. There's no way to invalidate a piece of content. Uh, in Docker Content Trust, uh, not only does removing something from the collection and republishing that collection invalidate an old or vulnerable piece of content, each, each collection actually expires in its own right. So you as a maintainer on a particular image have to regularly come in and recertify that yes, all of the content in my collection is still valid. And this prevents cases where somebody comes across unmaintained content that's still carrying vulnerabilities that haven't been remediated. And they will get a warning that tells them that they might want to not use this particular piece of content. So Docker Content Trust can be used to validate all of the content coming into your builds and also the content that eventually gets deployed onto your cloud. Um, and it's really simple to enable. Uh, it's a single environment variable, uh, Docker Content Trust. You set it to one. And like we said, it protects against a number of things. It protects against just completely unsigned content. So you can use it to implement policies that say, we will only run signed content, and it will stop you ever using anything that isn't. Uh, so if here, for example, we try and uh, build a Docker file that is trying to build some unsigned content, the build itself will just say, nope, I don't have trust data for this. If there has been some malicious behavior, uh, in this case, it's that there are not enough signatures on the content. But potentially, if the content has been modified and the signatures are no longer correct, somebody's tried to tamper with the keys, uh, or potentially somebody's tampered with the image itself, you're going to get a warning that says, you know, something has happened here. This is, might even be malicious. You don't want to trust this content. And finally, we said it protects against stale images. Uh, if you try and pull something that hasn't been maintained by the publisher, you're going to get a warning that says this is out of date. Uh, now, in some cases, you might decide, like, this is OK. Uh, but that's going to be up to you. And you need to make a conscious decision to say, you know what? There are other things here that mean I know this piece of content is good. It's OK that the guy is you know, a couple of days behind on his signing. And having done all of that validation, obviously, you sign the package that you output. And this is really important, because now we can get these signed chains of images with one built on top of another, which is how a lot of images in the Docker Hub work already. You know, you're probably building on top of some base image, which is itself built on another base image. For example, Debbie and Jesse uh, could be used as a base image for an app that your company is eventually going to build in Rails. So on top of Debbie and Jesse, you uh, take the Ruby package, and you build that in, and you produce another image that is a Ruby base image. And then on top of that, you add Rails, and now you have a Rails base image. And then anybody in your company can pull that Rails base image to produce their own specific applications. And at every point in this chain, you want all of those images to be signed so that somebody in your company who is auditing that final image can go back and say, yes, we really did build off the official Rails image, which was built off the official Ruby image, which was built off the official Debian image. And we're happy because you know, our uh, auditing says, like, yes, official images are good. So you follow general best practices. You've put only known good components in your build. You've signed it and pushed it up to a registry. But as it's sitting there waiting to be deployed, new vulnerabilities could be discovered, which your application has exposure to. So how do people usually deal with this? They enumerate all their dependencies, um, and hopefully dependencies of dependencies, what their OS, uh, any kind of components in their OS. And then they subscribe to the relevant CVE lists so that they can get notified of new discovery, if new vulnerabilities against these components are discovered. It's a very manual, tedious process. Um, and this kind of vetting is kind of done in a sporadic basis, even at a uh, very security conscious companies because it introduces a huge overhead on top of already de having to deliver bug fixes um, and features and keeping your service up and running. 
And here's where uh, Docker security scanning can help because it can automate this vetting process every single time you build a new application. If you enable the Docker security scanning service, which is available on Docker Cloud um, to, for private repositories, then all, whenever you um, upload an image, it will be automatically scanned and audited for vulnerabilities, and you will see um, the scan results here, which is it enumerates all the components of every layer of your image. Um, it tells you what version they are, what the licenses might be, and whether there are any known CVEs against that component. Um, which is really cool, but how exactly do we do this? Um, well, when you push an image up to Docker Cloud, it triggers off a job that pulls that image from uh, the, the registry, and then it sends that uh, image to our scanning service, which breaks it up into its composite layers, and then further breaks down those layers into individual binaries, which, uh, and it sends all of this data to our validation service, which matches each one of those binary hashes against um, a known CVE database, such as nbd or mitre.org. Um, when it finishes matching every single component, uh, the information comes back as a JSON file and is stored in our database for your image um, so that it can be presented to you when you look at the image like this. But what's really cool is that uh, we actually subscribe to CVE notifications so that whenever there's a new CVE that's discovered, uh, we are notified. We then rescan all the images uh, in our database and we notify um, any image account owners uh, that their images might be vulnerable. And we email them with a notification like this, which enumerates what the CVE is, what images they own might, uh, are vulnerable. And this is super powerful because it saves you a lot of work. You will know immediately what images you have to fix to remediate the issue. And as your images are sitting in the repository, we're rescanning them constantly so that they're not being outdated over time. And if you have a chain of trusted images, um, this is even better because you can automate the re remediation. If the first image in the chain has a vulnerability, all you have to do is rebuild and patch that image and set up an automation to trigger re automatic rebuilds, for instance, like the automation the Docker uh, Hub has, um, so that if one image is rebuilt, then all the descendant images will also be rebuilt, creating a virtual cycle of automated remediation. Um, once you've built all those images, you can check to see which ones need to be signed. For instance, here it shows one of the images has been outdated because it's been rebuilt. Um, and once you re-sign them using Docker Content Trust, you can then gate your deploys um, by running only signed images. Um, this will prevent you from being able, uh, this will prevent anyone from being able to prevent, uh, to run a freeze or rollback attack against you that tries to get you to install some kind of old vulnerable image, such as one with Heartbleed. Um, but that's, that's for new deploys. So what about your existing deploys? What about containers that you already have deployed based on that old uh, outdated image? Um, well, you can search for uh, any containers that are based on images that are descendants of vulnerable images, and these are the containers that you have to kill and restart. So we've created our good images, we've scanned them, we've potentially remediated any vulnerabilities, we now want to deploy them onto our cluster, but we need our actual cluster to be secure in the first place. So a simple thing you can do is just to run Docker Bench. Uh, this has been updated as of Docker 1.11, um, and it's gonna give you a checklist of things that you should just fix, or potentially things that you might want to look into a little bit more, just to make sure that you're really running everything the way you mean to. For example, it's gonna give you warnings about things like you're not running a single process inside the container, you're running more than one process. Well, under some applications that might be expected, but now you're gonna have a list that says these are the things that you should look more closely at. Uh, even more excitingly, uh, I think we heard this morning in the keynote that uh, Docker Swarm has now been merged into uh, Docker 1.12. Uh, and importantly, that comes with really strong default security. If you don't do anything, you're still gonna be using mutual TLS by default across the entire cluster. Uh, you have managers, you'll have between one and seven managers. Uh, you want an odd number because you have to get consensus. It uses the Raft protocol to build consensus between the managers. Um, and more than seven managers, Raft tends to get uh, less than performant, um, but seven managers can still manage thousands and thousands of workers, so this is still highly scalable. Um, interestingly, you don't want two managers. Uh, aside from the fact that two managers might disagree on things, 
Um, because one of two is exactly 50% and not more than 50%, if one of those two fails, your cluster is down. So you actually have uh, more fragility than if you just ran a single manager. Uh, interesting side note. Uh, so you have a leader within this cluster. It's elected via raft, and that leader acts as a CA. Uh, and any manager can eventually be promoted to be the leader and take over the role of CA. But that CA issues those certificates we saw earlier that have the organization as the cluster ID, the role of the worker as the organizational unit, and the node of the particular Oh, excuse me, the node of the particular ID as the uh, common name. And using these certificates, all of the nodes within your swarm cluster can communicate with each other via mutual TLS. And not only they have that encryption, but they're also identifying that nodes are operating in the correct way for the role that they've been assigned. Uh, additionally, there's support for external CAs. Uh, the uh, manager that is the leader will just forward all of the CSRs to your external CA. Uh, so if your organization already has uh, a certificate authority that they trust, you can continue to use that. But something that's really cool, uh, and it solves one of the most painful problems in dealing with certificates, is that there is automatic certificate rotation, and it's based on top of a whitelist. Uh, normally, with certificates, you'll be dealing with uh, certificate revocation lists or the OCSP protocol. Um, and instead of having to keep a list of, uh, a list of blacklisted certificates, which can get very large, uh, your whitelist of certificates is going to be capped at the number of nodes in your cluster. So we have a whitelist of all of the valid certificates with a customizable rotation period. Uh, and I think this goes as low as 30 minutes. So every 30 minutes, every certificate in your cluster can be rotated. Um, but interestingly, we don't want to accidentally DOS the CA. So whatever you set as your rotation period, the certificate will actually have an expiry somewhere in the 50 to 80% range of that expiry period. So you don't get this effect of you spin up an enormous cluster with 10,000 nodes, and in 30 minutes, all 10,000 nodes come to the CA and say, give me a new certificate. It'll be staggered within the 50 to 80% range of that 30-minute period. Uh, and this automatic rotation is going to ensure that any certificates that have been potentially compromised or leaked are rotated out of use, which if you've seen the figure on how long it normally takes an uh, exploit to be detected within a large uh, organization, it's in the order of like six months. So it is really important that you're actually regularly rotating certificates because it can prevent uh, compromises that you haven't even detected from uh, extending their lifetime. And then obviously, we have to be able to add additional nodes to our cluster, because if we can't dynamically scale our cluster, uh, it's not especially useful. You, know, you don't want to like, preempt and say, ah, I might eventually need 10,000 nodes, so I'm going to spin them up, but I'm only going to use one right now. So there are three ways that you can add new nodes into your cluster. The first is automatic acceptance. It's not very secure, but it's great for bringing up entirely new clusters that you can then audit and make sure they're good before you start deploying things onto them. You can also use a secret token, uh, which is just like a password. It's going to pre-authenticate uh, a node um, by giving it that secret piece of information so that it can go and identify itself to the leader of your cluster. And then finally, there's manual approval. So a node can come online and communicate with a manager and say, I would like to join the cluster and the manager will put it into a pending state. Uh, you then need to come along and explicitly authorize that this node can join the cluster, at which point the manager will issue the certificate to that node. So let's see a little demo of all of this like certificate communication in Swarm. OK. Um, hang on, hang on. I need to turn on mirroring. And cool. So um, we're actually demoing SwarmKit right now instead of Docker Swarm because it will be easier to see what's going on with the certificates under the hood and also because it was easier for me to compile a binary that rotates certificates every five seconds because um, we're only here for another 15 minutes, not for three months. So um, here's a little scratch space. We're going to create um, a directory for every node we're going to spin up so that we can see all the certificate, uh, certificates that are created. And here's the command to uh, use SwarmKit to spin up a Swarm daemon. Um, this would just be Docker Swarm init uh, in Docker. So uh, it spins up. We then connect it to the Swarm socket. And we can see that there's only a single node. It's uh, ready for, to, it's listening for connections. It's uh, a manager. And this little star means that it's the leader of its cluster, because there's just one right now. So let's uh, demonstrate the auto accept uh, policy for a worker. And if you want to see what policies your cluster has, you can do the inspect. Again, Docker Swarm inspect uh, cluster would also work. 
Um, so the current default roles are auto accept for worker. So let's add a single worker. Um, we're joining the first node. And as you can see, it's requested TLS credentials from the manager. Its role is a worker, not a manager. And now um, it's downloading a new certificate every five seconds because that's our rotation period. And we can see that the manager is issuing the certificate every five seconds. So let's have a look at that certificate, actually. Uh, so I'm just running the watch command, which will um, rerun this command every single time the data changes. So, oh, sorry, that was node one. I actually want node two. Cool. So um, again, this is the cluster ID that we showed you before. This is the node ID. This is the role. And every single time the certificate rotates, the little black uh, text means that that's the diff in uh, the data. So it's a serial number, the public key data, and um, that's basically, the, it's just the key data that changes. Um, it's, the node identity remains the same throughout the life cycle of the host. So cancel that. Um, so that was auto accept but we want to see what manual uh, acceptance looks like. So let's join a new manager to the cluster. Um, this is the exact same command, except I'm just passing the manager flag. And if you'll notice before, it requested a TLS certificate immediately and was granted one. Here, nothing's happening. So let's go back to the cluster and see, list the nodes. As David mentioned, it's uh, presented to you in pending state. You have to manually accept it, which we can do now. That was a different node. And now we have three nodes, two managers, which we'll fix shortly. Um, and that acceptance uh, command is actually passed uh, from Swarm CTL through a manager. It's proxy to the leader, so the leader actually has to execute all these commands and um, write them to raft. So, okay. Um, so now let's demonstrate a secret token uh, joint uh, acceptance policy. So you, you just need to update your cluster, and this is how you would rotate um, shared secrets also. Uh, we're setting the secret to DockerCon 2016. So if you inspect the cluster again, um, we can see the uh, bcrypted token that we just passed. So every node that joins will have to provide the exact same token in order to be accepted into the cluster. So let's go to our fourth node. We're gonna try joining first without any secrets. It's immediately rejected. We're going to pass a bad secret. It's immediately rejected because the hashes differ. Um, and it's just storing the hashes, it's not storing the password, so nothing actually gets replicated. Um, so now we're going to pass the actual good password. And we can see that it gets a certificate immediately because it's authenticated, um, has a credentials of a swarm worker. So cool. And we said we were going to fix the two manager issue by making there be three managers. So how can we do that? Uh, we can, uh, a host is not tied to a single role for its entire lifetime. You can promote a worker to a manager. You can demote a manager to a node. So let's promote a node two to become a manager. Cool, so now we have three managers. Um, node one is still the leader because it's been doing a pretty good job. And if we look at node two, we can see that previously it was getting certificates as a swarm worker. Um, here's some raft messages regarding it being promoted. And now it's getting uh, certificates as a swarm manager. Cool. So now if you notice, um, node two is just downloading new certificates. Node three, also a manager, just downloading new certificates. Node one, which is the leader, is the only one actually issuing certificates. But if it dies, um, this responsibility is handed off transparently to other managers. The um, certificate key is uh, automatically synced via raft and can be encrypted um, using a uh, environment variable that you can pass to the managers. So let's kill node one and see what happens. The socket is dead, so we actually have to connect to the socket of a different uh, manager. And we can see that node one is still in the cluster. It's just unreachable. So node two has kindly taken over its leader, uh, leadership responsibilities by generating certificates. And we can see that it's doing its job by watching the uh, worker certificate uh, for node four and seeing if it actually changes. Just take a little bit, and there it goes. 
Um, so new certificate rotation is still happening. The responsibility has been passed seamlessly from one, node, one manager to another. Uh, so if we go to node one, uh, we mentioned before that um, we changed the acceptance policy now to require a shared token to, rejoin, to join a cluster. <laughs> But that secure token is only required to bootstrap the initial join process. If you still have a valid certificate, you can rejoin no problem. And certificate renewal is uh, authenticated by your previous certificate. That's why uh, the rotation period is between 50 and 80% of the expiry date, so that you can use a previous certificate to get a new certificate. So let's rejoin the cluster. And it's join no problem. I did not pass a secret. I did not type in DockerCon 2016. And if we list the nodes again, we have all four active roles, um, three managers, all reachable, and we have a fully working cluster again. And that's our demo for automatic certificate rotation and acceptance policies. So, so I just remember your slides are here. So just in summary, um, we've shown how Docker identifies different uh, components in our system. Um, we can then use uh, both official images to get good content into our build system and Docker Content Trust to validate it uh, to ensure that we are building quality images. Uh, Docker Content Trust is then used to secure transport of your images to their end uh, location. Security scanning can help us detect and remediate issues within our images, potentially even automatically through CI systems. And finally, uh, Docker Swarm and Bench have uh, strong security and can provide us visibility on improvements we can make to the security of the actual cluster we're going to deploy to. But we thought it was important to, to bring up the fact that not everybody's deploying on Linux. Some people are deploying on Windows. Uh, so we actually asked uh, Surahan here to come and talk a little bit about uh, some isolation work that's been going on for Windows containers. Hi, um, thanks for the people that are leaving. I was already nervous. Uh, <laughs> so let's begin. Uh, I'm gonna give you guys a, a quick overview of the uh, security of the Windows Container Runtime. And let's begin with this marketing approved architectural diagram. So um, you guys have probably seen something similar in Linux. Uh, it's pretty much the same concept, multiple user spaces in, on the same machine, one kernel. But there are some differences between the Windows and Linux worlds, so let's zoom in. Um, first off, uh, we have a singular Win32 user mode here, uh, represented by the container. We have uh, its own dedicated system processes, including the session manager and the local security authority, as well as any application processes you might have developed. Um, so we have some good news on one front. Our, by default, our machines, do, uh, our, our uh, application processes do not run at root or local system as we call it. Instead, we run it as a dedicated uh, container user that only exists within this namespace of the container itself. Uh, because we have our own local security authority, we can get away with that. Any adjacent container would not have the same kind of user. Um, however, uh, it's not all great news. So our system processes are a little funky. They're not traditional user mode processes, they actually talk to the uh, kernel in a very deep and um, different way than anything you see in Linux. And um, that changes our isolation model a little bit. In addition, um, Windows applications do not usually uh, talk to the kernel directly, but instead use a uh, user mode uh, library to, uh, to send calls straight to the kernel. Uh, this means that uh, seccomp style syscall filtering doesn't really make sense um, for Windows. So while we think the security of uh, the Windows Server containers are great for most people's uses, I, we have a bunch of people that want even more isolation and um, have scenarios such as uh, hostile multi-tenancy, and or sometimes even um, just men, uh, regulatory requirements to separate things on a more deeper level. And for those people, we have Hyper-V containers. And this is essentially a Hyper -V, uh, an optimized Hyper-V partition that runs specifically one single Windows Server container. 
The uh, beauty of this is that it is completely transparent to the admin whether or not you're running in Windows Server containers or Hyper-V containers. And all it does is it provides you with um, your own kernel to do your own thing. And if, God forbid, any kind of kernel uh, attack occurred on any of your containers, oh, God, uh, I guess my transitions didn't exist. The, uh, the kernel would be, uh, the kernel, uh, the attacker would be isolated to the kernel of the uh, Hyper-V container itself, and they would not be able to uh, reach into any adjacent containers or the host itself. Um, so here is uh, an overview of both. You can see that it's exactly the same commands that you know and love from Linux, uh, with the exception that if you want to run a Hyper-V container, you just add that isolation Hyper-V flag, and then you're off to the races. That means all the, uh, um, like the entire interaction model is tr completely the same, but that also means that all the great stuff that David and Ying just talked about also apply to Windows containers. And uh, if you wish, you can run both Windows Server containers and Hyper-V containers on the same machine. I get that question asked a lot. And uh, we are, yeah, that's about it. Uh, Windows Server containers are coming in Windows Server 2016. Uh, there's a technical preview available now. So to learn more about all the technologies we um, discussed today, uh, the Docker docs are a great place to search in the first place. Um, you can also look at uh, the a Swarm Kit demo that I used um, at our uh, GitHub repo for SwarmKit, and you can download a technical preview of a Windows server um, at that URL right there. So that's it, and uh, thank you. Are there any questions? Can we go to the mics? Oh, uh, if anybody does have any questions, yes. here. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Ooh, wow. Please go to for, the microphones. Yeah. Which for, the, uh, for the security scanning functionality available at Docker Cloud, is that going to be available for a trusted registry at some ever? Yes, absolutely. It's being worked on right now. Okay. Do you know when? I don't have a date for it, but um, we're actually sitting next to the guys working on it. So okay. it is being actively worked on right now. Awesome, thanks. The guy on the left is Currently, we're do doing our. Oh, oh. Sorry. Sorry. Go ahead. Oh. That. It's the last session. We have a lot of time for questions. So if, if you lose any of your uh, Raft quorum members, um, what do you do? Do you, add, do you dynamically add new ones to the quorum or, or not? Sorry. There's a bit of an echo. Could you repeat that? Yeah. So you, know, you, you guys mentioned you're using Raft as the consensus protocol, right? Mm -hmm. So if you lose some of your quorum members, like let's say you know, if you have a 100 node cluster and if you have like seven of them in your quorum, right? Mm -hmm. And if you lose a few, uh, do you guys dynamically rebuild your quorum, or how, um, do you, how do you maintain your fault tolerance, essentially? When the nodes come back up, like, um, if you have uh, less than, if you have seven nodes and you have, like, uh, if, if there's a network okay, partition, the then the three well. will probably not, will not perform a leader election, because it will detect that it's not a quorum split. Um, and if the leader happened to have been in those three, it will probably just stop writing. But the, then the four that remain will do leader election there and be, be able to continue operations. So. I see. So you don't have any. So you don't necessarily rebuild uh, quorum members if they just die, right? Yeah. Okay. Okay. We're currently running a lot of Docker services, or basically each of our applications within a Docker run is calling out to a remote API. We're re we're also maintaining. Many, uh, many customers' credentials. So we're actually pulling those cred customer credentials in order for them to make the calls to those specific APIs. The concept of Swarm is very new to me uh, at this conference coming here. And I was kind of wondering, right now what we're doing is we're passing in a payload that co contains those credentials in order for the run to start. Is there, uh, looking at the Swarm technology or the Swarm approach, what would you recommend in us, instead of us just passing in a payload, could we just see as being a swarm manager that's actually providing the authentication and providing the credentials to the swarm workers? Uh, uh, that's a big question mark. <laughs> so the, the swarm managers are credentialing the nodes as workers. They're not doing uh, currently any additional work to provide uh, runtime data. Uh, 
the answer to that that we want to give is secrets. Uh, we are starting work on secrets. There will be a mechanism for injecting uh, protected data into containers at runtime based on the identity of the particular container. OK, so the other approach has been people said, why don't you do environment pass in your credentials through as an environment variable? So could you repeat that? I was so the other thought was, oh, well, if you can't use Swarm, then pass in your credentials as an environment variable? That's how um, it is right now. Yeah. Um, because we don't have a secret service, we would ideally like to transition that to a more secure uh, thing. But right now, that's what we have. OK, thank you very much for your talk. Okay, the, uh, the Hyper-V isolation option in the Windows containers was very interesting. Is there any thought, or do you anticipate that that'll be available in the Linux versions, like an Intel clear containers option, something like that? <laughs> no plans at the moment. Okay, thank you. Quick question. In the Hyper-V containers also, do those run on developer machines? Can you actually host those you know, on your local machine? Yes. Um, well. Uh, I, uh, I think uh, right now there is an insider preview of Windows 10 that has contain the container feature available to you to enable. Mm -hmm. That includes Hyper-V. Yes, I know. It's great. Um, in addition, you can also uh, download and install uh, Windows Server uh, 2016 uh, technical previews that uh, have had that since, I believe, November. Okay. Um, also, nested virtualization will allow you, which we also enabled in the, this coming version of Windows, to uh, run multiple uh, layers of VMs. So you, you could actually have a VM of Windows Server 2016 running Hyper-V containers on top of that. Cool beans. Thank you. Um, how do you uh, prevent spoofing or of the node ID? And how do you know uh, if someone took an existing uh, member which is uh, authenticated and says, OK, I'm this ID and I want to join. Uh, so that's the point of having uh, secrets or manual authentication of nodes. Um, you shouldn't be using auto acceptance and like a running steady state cluster in production. Oh, so let, let, you have to take some physical action that says, yes, I created this node. I asked it to join the cluster. Uh, and you instruct the manager to issue the credentials to that node. But let's say after you already did it for a specific node ID, and you approved. Now another node, which normally would get a different ID, says, reports to you, this is my ID. Now it can get all the notification and join as if it's a, a shadow of well, no, so the, the other one. The certificate that's been issued contains your node ID. So you can't forge that certificate, because most nodes aren't CAs. So I can't just come along and say, like, oh, no, I'm, I'm this ID now because I can't get a certificate that has that ID inside it. So you could like, um, that's why we separate the secret uh, um, shared token bootstrapping along with the certificates. So you want the certificate to um, expire after a very brief period of time, like a fairly brief period of time, so that if you have, for instance, like a backup volume or something, and you can't, you can't bootstrap a node with the exact same um, certificates and join, because hopefully the certificates will be expired by then. Um, one, one reason uh, we made rotating the shared secret so easy is you can like set a shared secret, bootstrap all your nodes up, then rotate it because none of those nodes need that secret anymore mm -hmm. once they have the certificates. So the shadow will not get the update when it mm -hmm. expires. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I had two questions. The first being the security scan, does it provide details about any daemon hardening that you've done? and uh, in the daemon settings for runtime and into, let's say, an AMI that you made? And if so, can it shut down nodes that don't match the daemon settings that you want them to have? So security scanning is on the static serialized images. Uh, when you say daemon, do you mean the Docker daemon? Yes. It completely separated from that. It has no touch points against the Docker daemon. So is there any, uh, is there any service that um, Docker is going to provide to check your daemon settings? Um, I'm not aware of anything at the moment, but uh, that's actually something that's interesting. So I, if you can stick around, that would actually be interesting to talk to you about that more. So Definitely. something like Docker Cloud can automatically detect that this now has a vulnerability. Right. I'm going to shut down those nodes, yeah, potentially. Yeah, like, hey, the memory percentage just went up by 500%. Uh, and now there's, you know, it's utilizing way more new things. Like, why is it doing that much stuff? Kill. 
right? Okay. Like something yeah. like that. There's, there's no plans to do that at the moment, um, but it does sound like an interesting idea. My second question was, so there's the manual cert operation that you, I, you mentioned, and you could press yes or press no. Um, is there, is that come out or is that provided as some kind of endpoint that we could utilize? So let's say uh, I don't want as an engineer to have to press yes 100 times uh, or once even. Could it go to someone above me that, hey, let's start the swarm and receive the first request and he says, he gets an email with a, you know, an, a URL and he can hit the URL and it would send the endpoint, send the request to the endpoint to for yes, instead of doing it through the command line. Is, is that a thing? Yeah, I would have to double check with uh, Diogo, who couldn't be here and wrote literally all of the code for this. Mm -hmm. um, I believe the answer is yes. Uh, all of the communication between the nodes, uh, and between the client and the nodes, is implemented with gRPC. Okay. Um, so potentially, you could even take the gRPC definition and compile it into whatever your favorite language is and build your own client to interact with it. Excellent. Thank you. This may seem like an obvious thing, but Docker Content Trust, is that part of the Docker tools, or do we have to download something else? Or? As of 1.8, if okay. I remember back, uh, Docker Content Trust was built okay. so into do. Docker. Okay. Um, the, so there is a notary tool, which is sort of the power user version. Um, mm -hmm. But if you just want to use it at a very basic level, it's all built into Docker. If you want to do very complex operations, like deal with collaborators, all of whom can sign independently, uh, you have to go and get notary. notary. Thank you. Uh, first off, this is great stuff, guys. So good job. Um, really impressive. Um, my question is about the, the trusted registry. So one of the premises you mentioned was uh, this thing of auth authorization, or sorry, authentication, integrity, and then freshness, et cetera, right? I'm wondering about a stage before that, which is trust. So as a consumer of an image in the ecosystem, how can I reason about the trustworthiness of the person who's published that image, not knowing them, and being kind of uh, you know a part of the community that's away from them, you know. Yeah. So key distribution is a horrendously difficult problem. Um, so in the GPG world, you have to go somewhere and find the person's public key yeah. and inject it into your system to say use this key. Uh, there are a couple of mechanisms we're sort of working with and making available, and we're waiting for people to give us feedback. Um, we've implemented what we've called trust pinning. Uh, so you can do the same thing. You can find out a particular key and say, I only want to trust this key for this particular image. Um, but additionally, within an organization, uh, you often have the ability to implement a CA and issue your users with certificates off that CA. Uh, and we can then configure that in to say, I only want to trust uh, images for which the public key is a certificate issued from the CA. Um, so potentially that's easier for an organization to manage because they inject the one CA and they can now trust all of the images from all of the users in their system, regardless of like who's creating what and new images that are being built. Um, but we're kind of we're open to feedback on that. Uh, we'd like to make acquiring keys easy or trusting new content easy, um, but it, key distribution is kind of not a well-solved problem. Actually, the GPG example is interesting. What about if you could ascribe trust to another contributor? And so an, an, ima an image can build up trust based on other peers validating that person is trustworthy or that publishing house is trustworthy. Yeah, and Notary has the ability to do that. Oh, it does um, have that, okay. We, so we've uh, taken the delegation system. This is like getting slightly in depth. So I can talk about it more sure, afterwards in detail. Yeah, but very there is good. a system that allows multiple people to sign the same piece of content. And then uh, on our next project is working on actually building that gating into UCP. So you can say, do not deploy this image unless it was built by my CI system and signed by my QA team. Okay. Very good, thank you. Hi, my question is about security during the build process and specifically how to manage credentials. Uh, for, for example, if you have an application that needs to download libraries that come from private GitHub repos, for example, how do you sort of manage that without having to inject a private key inside a container, which is probably not a good idea, but the only thing I've found out to do. Um. The way I've managed that so far is by not asking the container to clone it, but by cloning it like the repo onto the host and copying it in. Uh, it's not a perfect solution. Um, doesn't work for things like auto builds very well. Uh, any sort of development to sort of pardon? Any development plans to sort of fix that, sort of allowing the sort of credential chain to actually go from the sort of clients to the sort of Docker? Yeah, uh, I know that the. Um, 
team that works on auto builds has been trying to find better ways to deal with GitHub credentials. Because at the moment, I think you have to give the auto builds a token that gives you access to like all of your private repositories. Um, I don't know that they've found a good solution to it yet. Uh, and it seems to be that's just the status quo for GitHub at the moment is. Well, it's actually any private sort of repository, right? Yeah. OK, thanks. Hey, so my question is about the Swarm Manager being a CA. So it's great that it's a CA, but I guess what I'm wondering is the problem with being a CA is that it's, it's a single source of compromise, right? So if I was to do something on the manager and <coughs> compromise that CA, in Excuse theory, me. I could then be bad towards everything else, right? So what have you guys kind of done to protect that? Or um, Sorry. Oh, one sec. Road is kind of dry. Um, you can, the only way we provide, um, you can encrypt the uh, CA key right now um, using, and you can rotate that encryption so that like as, uh, as leadership changes, um, each leader re-encrypts the key in a different way uh, using environment variables because we don't currently have a better solution. You could also, um, we support other CAs, so if you have like a more secure CA system, you could hook into that instead of relying on ours. Okay. So I still have, the, I guess, the problem of if at some point somebody compromises, it's then compromised. I'm just wondering there are things around distributed trust and other mechanisms out there. Are you guys looking at that? or? Yeah, you have to secure your manager. So. And I guess the other, just a second question then is, are you guys looking at extending this with secrets into containers themselves, such that you can do a container, kind of container a security TLS um, when you basically spin up your swarm, then is that going to be available potentially to the containers themselves to do end-to-end -end TLS? Um, I actually couldn't hear that yeah, question so. very well. So I'm saying that, can you do, are you guys looking at extending it such that the containers themselves can utilize the CAs and effectively do container-to-container -container TLS? Um, we're not intending to do that at the moment. Uh, when we've talked about similar things in the past, um, the preference has generally been that we don't want to sort of mix the responsibilities, so that almost certainly won't happen. Um, but that doesn't mean that there won't necessarily be some kind of CA concept that does allow you to plug in a CA for your swarm to use at the sort of container and application level. Uh, cool. Thanks. My question is somewhat related to the CA question. Um, do you have support for HSMs or are planning to support them for the manager? Not currently at the moment, um, but it's not that far out of our wheelhouse. Uh, you know, we have uh, YubiKey support for um, Notary, um, and we are looking at HSM support there. So we would look at using HSMs for things like the CA and any other bits of the system that need to hold private keys. Uh, two questions. Uh, one with rotating the secret token. Um, have you given thought to only supporting like end uses? Before auto rotating, for example, yeah. uh, I know I know my clusters are going to be five nodes, so why couldn't I create a secret token and say it can only be used five times and then it will auto rotate? Um, I don't think it's being considered at all. This, that's like a perfect question for Diogo. Um, okay. But file it as a feature request. Sure, and you'll definitely get his opinion on it. <laughs> Second was in your demo, the validity period wasn't changing when search were being reissued? The expiry? Yeah. Yeah, um, I was trying to make the expiry actually work so that like, if I waited a really long time, it, um, before, like, if something went wrong with the demo between when I killed the node and okay. restarted it, it wouldn't expire. So I didn't set it to be the exact same time as the rotation period. Um, so it, it, the rotation period by default is about 50 to 80% of like, that expiry period. I just kind of deleted all that code and forced it to be five seconds. Related again to, um, to, to certificates or the, the CAs, if, if you do a manager promotion and then demotion, um, how do you handle making sure that your demoted node is no longer, like if somebody then compromises a node that's been demoted, that you have, <coughs> excuse me, then you haven't exposed the CA at that point? Um, we do that, I believe, with a uh, the certificate whitelist. So once you demote a node, the manager certificate is like no longer in that whitelist. So it can't reconnect as a manager. It has to get a new certificate. It essentially has to re-authenticate as an entirely brand new node. Uh, there isn't really a concept of like demotion. You 
kill the node. Or demotion is based destruction and recreation. Is it? Yeah. Thanks again for this informative session. I uh, wanted to figure out if you are thinking about um, uh, separating uh, uh, swarms' uh, capabilities into different privilege levels and kind of having secrets to talk uh, to different things with swarm. Like only some secrets are allowed to create new services, some are allowed to do X or Y or different tasks to the swarm. Oh, for the secret tokens? Uh, uh, no, as in like when talking to swarm. Uh, Tasks. Uh, and executing different tasks or creating new services or adding nodes. Uh, somebody who has access to the swarm uh, CLI needs another secret to kind of do, uh, like create a new service kind of jobs. Somebody has a different secret to kind of uh, so something like AWS as I am. And yeah. So all of the work that's being done for like AuthZ and AuthN plugins in the Docker engine mm -hmm. will apply to Swarm. Oh. So that'll be the mechanism for doing authentication authorization on actions within the Swarm. Thank you.